Hernan Cortes, 1485-1547, was a Spanish conquistador who led the conquest of the Aztec Empire in Mexico from 1519. Taking the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in 1521, Cortes plundered Mesoamerica as he became the first ruler of the new colony of New Spain. Cortes was a gifted leader of men, and he seized every opportunity presented to him in the New World. Using superior weapons and tactics combined with diplomacy to supplement his meager force of conquistadors with thousands of indigenous warriors, Cortes was able to sweep all before him. Initially rewarded by the Spanish crown, Cortes soon found himself overwhelmed by a new wave of colonial administrators and constant legal battles where he faced charges of exceeding his authority, taking more than his due in loot, and using excessive violence and terror against indigenous peoples. Early Life Hernan Cortés de Monroy y Pizarro Altamirano was born in 1485 in Medellín, Extremadura, Spain. His parents belonged to the petty nobility, his father being a Hidalgo. Hernan studied law at the University of Salamanca from 1499, but at 19 years old, he decided to leave Spain and try his luck in the Caribbean colonies. After running a plantation on eastern Hispaniola, Santo Domingo, and working as a notary in Azua de Compostela, he decided to participate in the conquest of Cuba in 1511. Seven years later, and now in his mid-thirties, he was itching for his stab at fame and glory. Perhaps not only out for gold, Cortés was a deeply religious man, and the spirit of evangelism, for him if not his followers, was an extra motivation to further open up this new world. Two Worlds Collide Diego Velázquez, 1465-1524, the governor of Cuba, had already sent several expeditions to explore the mainland coast of America starting in 1517, and these had reported strange ancient stone monuments and brightly dressed natives from whom were bartered fine gold objects. The governor organized another expedition and chose as its leader Hernán Cortés, who had served him as the alcalde, or chief magistrate, in Santiago de Cuba. Eleven ships were packed with five hundred soldiers and one hundred sailors, all of them adventurers and treasure seekers. At the last minute, wary of the scale of Cortés' preparations, Velázquez tried to recall his lieutenant, but it was too late. Cortés might have been the expedition leader but, as the historian S. Shepard explains, this was most certainly going to be a group effort. Cortés was undoubtedly a charismatic and inspirational commander, and although he had little practical military experience, he was, crucially, a leader capable of taking both utterly ruthless decisions and extravagant gambles to maximize his opportunities in a fluid and constantly changing geopolitical situation. As Shepard summarizes, a devout Catholic and inveterate bigamist, a crusader and an opportunist, a renegade and an imperialist, Cortés was a man of many contradictions. 21. The Aztec civilization, aka Mexica, had flourished from circa 1345 in Mesoamerica, and by the 16th century, it came to cover most of northern Mexico, an area of some 135,000 square kilometers with a population of around 11 million. The Aztecs used military coercion, hostages, and the extraction of tribute to hold their fragile empire together, but they had not conquered everyone. The Tarascans and Tlaxcalans, in particular, continued to probe at the borders of their empire. The Tlaxcalans and other peoples would prove to be invaluable allies of the Spanish as they were only too keen to see the downfall of the Aztecs. Cortés landed on the Tabasco coast at Patuncan on the Americas mainland in March 1519. The Old World was about to meet in person the current masters of Mesoamerica. Cortés and his men had no idea what they were about to face, but to make sure nobody entertained thoughts of going home, Cortés ordered the deliberate grounding and breaking up of his ships. It was now a case of conquer or die. Superior steel and gunpowder weapons, cavalry, and dynamic tactics ensured easy Spanish victories against the hostile peoples they encountered. Mesoamerican weapons and armor were primitive compared to that of the Spaniards. The Mesoamericans had razor-sharp obsidian-bladed swords and clubs, bows, spears, and dart throwers, but these made little impact against metal armor. 
On the other side, Spanish steel swords, long pikes, crossbows, and gunpowder weapons were devastatingly effective against warriors protected only by padded cotton cloth and wooden shields. Cavalry proved itself almost invincible against any number of Mesoamerican attackers. Finally, tactics did not help the indigenous peoples, who were used to ritualized warfare where display and taking captives took priority. Mesoamerican officers were easily identifiable with their extravagant costumes, and these were the first targets of the Spanish. When the officers were killed, very often the rank and file fled in panic. Mesoamerican warriors did learn new tactics and focused on ambushes on broken ground as a strategy to negate the strengths of cavalry, but the overwhelming military advantage, despite facing far superior numbers, remained in the hands of the Spaniards. A significant bonus in these early encounters was the capture of Malinsen, aka Marina, Malinali, or La Malinche, a Maya woman who spoke the Nahuatl language of the Aztecs and a local Mayan language, which one of Cortez' men was familiar with. The invaders could now communicate with potential allies. Malinsen and Cortez had a son together, Don Martin. Cortez later had another son, also called Martin, his mother was Dona Juana Ramirez de Ariano, the daughter of a Spanish count from Cuernavaca, but it was his illegitimate child with Malinson that Cortés favored, accompanying him to Spain and ensuring he was invested as a knight in the prestigious Order of Santiago. Motacuzoma and La Noche Triste Located on the western shore of Lake Texcoco, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had over 200,000 inhabitants, making it the largest city in the pre-Columbian Americas. It covered some 12 to 14 square kilometers and was connected to the western shore of the lake and surrounding countryside by three causeways, running north, east, and west, which included gaps traversed by removable bridges to allow boats to pass. The conquistadors were permitted to enter the city peacefully on November 8, and they marveled at its wonders of grand plazas, temple pyramids, and floating gardens. When Cortés and Motacuzoma met, initially, Relations were friendly. Valuable gifts were exchanged between the two leaders. Cortes received a necklace of golden crabs, and Motacuzoma a necklace of Venetian glass strung on gold thread and scented with musk. The Aztec ruler may have been wary of these visitors, having heard of their earlier military victories, but he seemed undecided what to do with them. Diplomacy, in any case, went out of the window two weeks later, when Cortés took Motacuzoma hostage on November 14. The Spanish wanted treasure, and the Aztec ruler was obliged to swear himself a subject of the King of Spain. There were other indignities like a crucifix being set up at the top of the sacred Aztec pyramid, the Templo Mayor. Cortés now had his own problems, though. With his rivalry with Velázquez at that point unresolved, the governor of Cuba had sent a force under the command of Panfilo de Narvaez to Veracruz to apprehend Cortés. Cortés was obliged to leave Tenochtitlan and meet these competitors for future treasure, and so, in May 1520, he left Tenochtitlan in the hands of a small Spanish force under the command of Pedro de Alvarado. Alvarado and his men proved rather insensitive to Aztec conventions when they unwisely attempted to interrupt a ceremony of human sacrifice and then massacred members of the Aztec nobility. The Aztecs rose up and killed a number of the interlopers. Meanwhile, Cortés defeated Narvaez and persuaded his remaining men to join him. They all returned to Tenochtitlan on June 24, where a handful of Spaniards were still holding out. In the still bubbling hostilities, Motacuzoma had been replaced by Quitlawak as the new Aztec leader after Cortes had foolishly released him from imprisonment. Quitlawak had immediately taken over rule of the Aztecs from his captive and now dishonored brother. Quitlawak organized a total war against the conquistadors. When the Spanish tried to use Motacuzoma to bring calm to the situation, the former leader was struck by a rock and killed on June 30. The Spanish became trapped in the royal palace of Xayacatl. Cortés managed to flee the city in a running night battle on June 30, 1520. This bloody retreat became known as the Noche Triste, Sad Night. The Spaniards had extricated themselves using temporary wooden bridges built for the challenging task of crossing the city's many canals, but the price of freedom was high. 
Cortez had lost half his men, most of his best horses, and all of the eight tons of loot he had been accumulating ever since he arrived in Mesoamerica. The Siege of Tenochtitlan Before reaching the safety of Tlaxcala territory, Cortez first had to win a great battle near Otumba on July 7, where the Aztecs tried once and for all to wipe out the foreign invaders. After several more campaigns, and receiving reinforcements by sea, several cities were captured, notably Texcoco on December 31, 1520. Cortés' plan was now to lay siege to Tenochtitlan, but already another, far more terrible enemy had swept through the Aztec population. There had been a devastating outbreak of smallpox in the previous September and November, which killed up to 50% of the population. The Aztecs also had a new leader, Cuauhtémoc, after Quitlahuac himself had succumbed to the imported disease. In April 1521, Cortés began his siege. His force included 700 infantry, 118 crossbowmen and harquebusiers, 86 horses, and 18 field guns. Most significantly of all, the Spanish had native allies, including at least 100,000 Tlaxcalans. Overcoming the deficiencies of their weapons, the Aztec warriors fought ferociously and with courage, as noted by the Spanish themselves. On April 28, 1521, Cortés deployed his trump card and logistical marvel, a fleet of 13 specially built warships on Lake Texcoco. These vessels, never before seen by Mesoamericans, were built from the great ships Cortés had ordered wrecked two years before and new supplies from Veracruz. They had been constructed prefabricated so that they could be transported by land to the lake. With these ships, Cortés was able to counter the many thousands of native canoes and block the three main causeways which linked the city to the edges of Lake Texcoco. Each brigantine carried 25 men plus six carrying crossbows and harquebusiers. The Spanish ships were escorted by a large fleet of canoes manned by their allies from Texcoco. Through May and June, men, horses, and ships persistently attacked the Aztec positions, forcing them into an ever smaller core group within the very center of Tenochtitlan. In one battle, Cortés was himself briefly captured before his men rescued him. Others were less fortunate and found themselves sacrificial victims. Still, Cortés persisted, systematically blowing up buildings as he tightened the siege. Finally, on August 13, after 93 days of resistance and long out of food and weapons, Cuauhtémoc surrendered. Indescribable atrocities, acts of revenge, and wild looting then followed. Honduras Death and Legacy Cortés next spent time back in Spain, arriving in May 1528 with treasures and forty Aztecs to wow the court. He persuaded Charles V to grant him great estates in the Americas, the title of Marquis of the Valley of Oaxaca, and the right to keep one-twelfth of any wealth he acquired. However, Cortés was already becoming a part of history. The now aged and few surviving conquistadors who had risked all for glory had been replaced by professional bureaucrats and evangelizing priests. When he returned to Mexico City in the summer of 1530, Cortés was barred from his own mansion by the new governor Gonzalo Nuno de Guzmán, died in 1558. Cortés was obliged to live in his second residence in Cuernavaca. He also became embroiled in many lawsuits from his rivals and former followers who were convinced their leader had taken much more than his fair share of loot during the conquest. There were also cases to be answered for his mistreatment of indigenous peoples, Hernán Cortés died of dysentery in Castilleja la Vieja in Spain on December 2, 1547. The great adventurer had been about to depart again for the New World.